So Galatians chapter 3 says this, Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. As we continue in our study in the book of Genesis, we come to Abraham, who is a gigantic figure in the Bible. He lived some 4,100 years ago in the city of Ur, which was the center for Sumerian culture. I'm going to be jumping back and forth to passages, but I also want to read from Hebrews, and we'll be reading a bunch of stuff from Hebrews this morning because, um, because Abraham's mentioned there so often, and um, we'll do that, that week, this week and next week. But this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 12. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become the father because he con considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. When I read in Scripture that God can use a guy who was as good as dead, there's hope for me. <laughs> we better pray. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for loving us the way you do. We do praise you for a good uh, two weeks of day camp, Lord, being able to use this place in a very different way for a wonderful purpose. We thank you for using that in the way you do in so many marvelous ways. And, and now as we come, uh, we open your word together. We look at the life of Abraham, Lord. Um, we pray that you would, as always, be our teacher that you would lead us and you would help us to hear what you want us to hear as we read passages and as we consider this man and his faith and the faith that you want us to have and as we consider your promises. Lord, would you bless us and use this time for good. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Genesis 1 to 11, we've already kind of covered, skimmed over them, but that describes the beginning of all things in history and God's dealing with the entire human race. And here at the end of chapter 11, moving into chapter 12, we discover God's dealings with a particular people. There is no Hebrew nation until God takes this man, plucks him out of Ur of the Chaldees, brings him to the land of Canaan and establishes the Jewish people. That's how important Abraham is. His name was Abram at the beginning, exalt, meaning exalted father. God changes that name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. When I read through some of these passages, it might say Abram and the pastor's saying Abraham. Forgive me. <laughs> That's his name. He's a key figure in Israel's history. And the bulk of the Old Testament is God's work through the descendants of Abraham. And he is the biggest name, if you would, in all of Christendom until the person of Jesus Christ comes along. And the book of Hebrews talks about that as well. Abraham was a man of great wealth, and it, it, it suggests that he was living a comfortable life in one of the world's great cities when God calls him. His and this move was no simple move. And when we talk about Abraham's faith, it begins by being willing to leave the very comfortable and venture into the unknown. The passage we just read from Hebrews 11, 8 said he did not know where he was going. It is a verse my wife often whispers in my ear when we're on road trips. 
Thank you for laughing as I tend to wander. But he would live this nomadic life for approximately a hundred years and after God has called him. He was married to a woman named Sarah, who by every account was a beautiful woman. We're told that because of the number of times uh, that um, Abraham couches her as his sister. You probably remember those stories. Because of her beauty and his worry is that men will want her, which in fact they do when he visits different places. And he says, she's my sister. And in this highly questionable maneuvering, one of the pharaohs will come dangerously close to raping her. And as one of Abraham's missteps that I don't completely understand, uh, but that we may or may not get to as we look at Abraham, but I wanted to mention it because Abraham, who is this giant in the faith, and in fact is a man of great faith and a deep trust in God, it's a reminder for all of us that all of us have those, why did I do that moments? <laughs> which sometimes are repeated in our lives, and we say, why did I do that again? <laughs> which is exactly what Abraham does. And it's a blessed reminder of the grace of God and that he can use us. And Abraham is referred to in the New Testament as one of the giants of the faith. And it's such, such a good reminder. But I want to go back to the beginning, and we're going to, we're going to read in Genesis chapter 12. And... Um, just going to read the first three verses here. It says this, The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Abraham, at the time of his call, is in the city of Ur. The end of chapter 11 in Genesis makes, is a little unclear about where his whereabouts, but Acts chapter 7, the New Testament, in Stephen's speech, clears up where he, where he was when God called him. God calls uh, him to leave all that is familiar, his comfortable lifestyle, and go somewhere that you know nothing about. He's to leave his kinship group, which is a big deal. That's where families would care for one another. In their old age, they would pass land down to one another. They would, it was land and people were so important. God calls him to leave all of that. But he's also promising to give him a new land, to make him into a great nation, to make his name great, and that he would be a blessing, and all nations will be blessed through him. It's a incredible promise about what God will do through Abraham, through the people of Israel, and now as we see continuing through us as the church. And it's interesting that on the heels of the Babel story, which Josh talked about last week, he did a great job with that, which was about improper worship and about trying to manipulating and manipulate God, about thinking uh, or thinking that we can manipulate God, Josh mentioned that God is awesome and holy and magnificent and, and we cannot control him. And the Babel group of people were seeking to control God and make a name for themselves. And so now God comes to Abraham and says, I will make your name great. We'll talk about that in a moment. Chapter 12, verse 3. Uh, and some of you remember Dave Farmer used to be here. He used to teach. He was a former pastor and... Um, 12 verse 3 was what he called the anti-Semitism clause. And I love that. He, where it just says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. Whatever your political stance, um, there is wisdom to be pro-Israel because the Bible reminds us to do that. It is simply about the promise of God. So this is what we have in chapter 12, the call. And I want to jump over to chapter 15. There is so much information on Abraham. There's no way we cover that in two weeks, um, but that's what my assignment is for these two weeks. But Abraham's story is wonderful. I invite you to read through it. There's so much we're going to look at. 
uh, but there's so much we're going to leave out as well. So I'm skipping over to chapter 15. It's where God has made the covenant, and then sometime later, he's ratifying the covenant with Abraham. He does that as well in chapter 17 with the covenant of circumcision. But chapter 15, in verses um, 1 to 3, let me start there. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. There's that phrase again. Don't you love that in the Bible? All, all over Scripture, right? Do not be afraid. We were talking to the kids this week in day camp, Peter, you know, when they see Jesus walking on the water, what's the first thing he says? Don't be afraid, Peter. When Peter gets out and walks on the water, Jesus rescues him. He says, don't be afraid, Peter. We need to hear that so often, don't we? Abraham needed that. So he says, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Abram is stating for him the obvious. I don't have any children and you're telling me you're going to make me into a great nation, so it looks like I have this household servant. That's what people often did. They would care for their master in their old age, and they would inherit their wealth. And so Abraham is saying, I guess it's going to be him, because I don't see any other answer. And then verses 4 and 5, then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to them, him, so shall your offspring be. God was making this promise to Abraham of children, and he's saying, you will have a son. Look up at the stars. That's what your offspring is going to be like. So hard to fathom that. You know, he... He first gets this message, I believe, at the age of 75, and then we'll look later at 99, and he's told, you're still going to have a child, and it hasn't happened yet. And he tells him, here, go look at the stars. And then a key verse, a pivotal verse, that's quoted so often in, in the rest of Scripture, is Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. I read from Galatians 3 before. Let me just read from Romans 1. It's another place where it's quoted. It's quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted in the Old Testament. Abraham, um, Romans 4, 1 says this, What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. But what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. This whole passage, Paul goes on talking about Abraham being justified by his faith in God. And as I said, it's, a, it's such, such a huge verse. We find it in Galatians chapter 3, and we find it in um, some of the minor prophets. And here again, it, Abraham believed God. That's what he's asking for you and I, or from you and I, and we'll look at that again in just a moment, but to believe him. Let me read the rest of the chapter. Verse 7, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to, ta to give you this land, to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. 
But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation of your descendants, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the river Euphrates to the great river, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the uh, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Rephaites, the Termites, the Amorites. The, just seeing if you're paying attention. Well done. The Canaanites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, and the list goes on. This is the most unusual picture in Scripture. In many respects, it's completely unique. He takes these three-year-old animals, cuts them in half, puts the pieces on the side. I say almost completely unique when in some ancient covenants, when covenants were made between two people, they would, they would do such thing. They would take an animal and cut the pieces in half and walk through them. And what they were saying is, if I don't keep my part of the covenant, may I be like these animals, torn in two. So that does take place in ancient history, but not like this, because this is not two people making a covenant. This is one person making a covenant. It is God ratifying his promise. We're told that there's a smoking pot and a blazing torch. Again, unique and awesome. Somehow the spirit of God moving through these pieces as Abraham is watching. And so, as I mentioned, we're going to turn to Hebrews often, but Hebrews chapter 6, it's clarified again in the New Testament, and it helps shed some light on what's going on here. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13 talks about this promise that God is making. Verse 13 says this, When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. One thing, of people would make a covenant, they'd swear by someone greater than themselves. I swear by this king, or I swear by God. There's no one greater for God to swear by, because he is God. He is awesome, and he is sovereign over all. He swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so by so that by two unchangeable things in which is it, it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. And then here's a verse we often quote and love, and rightly so. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yesterday we had a funeral service for Jerry Moore, and I use this verse again because it is appropriate that when we lose a loved one, those of us who are trusted in Christ, we have an anchor for the soul. Because what is God is doing to Abraham is he's promising him, and in Abraham and in Jesus Christ hang, I'm sorry, in, in God himself and in Jesus Christ hang all the promises. And so we have, these hope, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. So when we talked yesterday about seeing Jerry again in heaven, that's because of the promise of God who said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, who said that surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These things are an anchor for our souls. And so he's reminding us of the certainty of God's promise 
And again, a, the usual covenant was between two parties, but this is God himself making the covenant, and Abraham is just watching. It's almost as if God is saying as he walked, as, as his spirit goes through these pieces, if I fail to keep my promises, may I be like these animals. We have the certainty of God's promise. And Abraham was put into this deep sleep, and the, he seals the promise with, with this awesome, mysterious, and powerful picture that shows us that God is confirming his promise to Abraham and through Abraham to all the rest of us. That he keeps, he is a promise-keeping God. You know, when I, looked at, I look at the life of Abraham, there's so much to talk about. We're going to stop here for today. I want to share a few thoughts with you as I was looking at these, uh, tying some of the truths in these passages together, and there are so many. But number one, the, one, the first thought that came to my mind is, is this, and it's to not waste our time trying to build our legacy. To not waste our time trying to build our legacy. Well, where do you get that? <laughs> or you know, what are you doing? Calling us to be lazy? Do you, not at all. Are you calling us to not care what we leave behind? Not at all. I'm calling you and me to rid ourselves of the misguided notion that we are self-made men or women. That's a dangerous place to be. That we would purge the errant thought that we somehow make a name for ourselves. This is what God says to Abraham. He says, I will make your name great. Not you, not your incredible work ethic, not your personal branding. I will do that. And that's important because it comes on the heels of the Babel story. And as I mentioned already, they were in the Babel story, they are minimizing God. They are patronizing him. They are building him this room on top of this ziggurat where they would want him to descend so they could kind of control him. And our God will have none of that. That kind of thinking is full of hubris and pride and self-absorption and everything else. And the text also tells us in the Babel text they were trying to make a name for themselves. We want people to know how good we are. I think of Abraham. If Abraham had stayed in Ur of the Chaldees, he would be a very wealthy man, and we would have never heard of him. But 4,000 years later, we are still chatting him up. <laughs> because God made his name great. He's just like Mary, when, when the angel comes to Mary, God says, future generations will call you blessed. And what has happened? Future generations call her blessed because she, like Abraham, was following God. You know, I say all this just because trying to build your own legacy ends in pride and self-aggrandizement and ends in a hollow place. We're told that all throughout Scripture. And Isaiah chapter 14 describes Satan's fall. He wanted to be like God. That's where he wanted to go. Adam and Eve in the garden had wanted their eyes open so they could understand and be more like God. The Babel builders wanted to bring God down and lift themselves up. Nebuchadnezzar, remember that story in Daniel? Isn't this Babylon that I have built for my glory <laughs> and all of my wonder? And he's driven away to, in the field like animals. Acts chapter 12, Herod. There's that little story. He visits the town. He proclaims this Herod day, and the people are going to worship him and praise him. This, somebody says this is the voice of a god and not man. The Bible tells us he was struck dead and eaten by worms. My point is this, those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. And it's a good thing to be wary of that. 
God reminds Abraham, I'm the one who's going to make your name great. You know what he asks of us? I always go back to our verse for the year. What does God require of us but to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God? We're not called to walk in pride. We're not called to make a name for ourselves. We're not called to personal branding and all this other nonsense. And that's as real in, in that day as it is today, right? How many likes can I get? <laughs> How many people will notice me on Facebook and this and that? It's the, the temptation is still there. It takes different forms. The Lord requires that we act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. I also see reading through these texts, and like I said, there's so much more, but a thing, couple things caught my eye. And one was to walk cautiously when we question God. There's a couple times that Abraham, or Abram at this time, is questions God. In chapter 15, that we were just looking at, in verse 2, he says this, But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? Now, God had said, I'm going to do this, but, and it's a fair question. I'm not saying it's a bad question. How will you do this? He's questioning God. Then also down in verse 8, but Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, when he was talking about the land, how can I be sure that I will gain possession of it? And then 17, 17, which we didn't look at, after a long discussion with God, Abraham fell face down and he laughed and said to himself, will a son be more born to a man a hundred years old? Again, fair question. <laughs> and I mention this because one of the things people often ask pastors is, can I question God? And again, it's an understandable question. And I think my answer is, yeah, of course you can. Just steal yourself because you will not get the answer that you expect. <laughs> I really think that's a true answer. In general, in Scripture, what God does is show people how awesome he is. In response to these questions in Genesis 15, it says that there was a thick and dreadful darkness that came over Abraham. In other words, he was shaking in his shoes. He was horrified because God was appearing. And that came over him. And he was showing Abraham who he is in that graphic picture. I think of Job when he questions God. Finally, towards the end of the book, Job says, he, he's questioning God with all these questions, and then God says, who, who is this who darkens my counsel with these questions? And then he hammers Job with a series of about 100 questions of his own that Job cannot answer, and finally Job says, I repent in dust and ashes. I, I, was, I spoke of things I didn't understand. I think of Zechariah in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, when he and Elizabeth are told they're going to have a child. And he, he's, how can I be sure, he says to the angel. And the angel says, well, I, I'm, one thing you're going to do is you're going to shut up for nine months because <laughs> you're not going to be able to talk. You know, over and over in Scripture, and David does it, you know, you can question God. All I'm saying is that my advice is to think twice about that and maybe still ask the questions, but we always come to the same place of surrender. You surrender. Why is this happening in our family over here? Why does my uncle have cancer? Why is this not going our way? Why is our family in disarray? Why am I looking for a job for nine months? Why, why, why? We don't get those direct answers from God. And some, often he shows us down the road, 
But in the midst of that questioning, we know as Christians, if you're a man or woman of faith, you know the answer is going to be surrender. Just surrender to my plan. You do not know what's going on. Abraham was last asked to leave his land and just go. And he went. And so it's just an interesting point about questioning God. Can we? Of course we can. But often the answer is going to come couched in us, him showing us how awesome he is, reminding us about how awesome and good he is. So in that sense, it's, we, it's not wrong or it's not that we shouldn't question God. We can, but he's going to show us and he's most often going to bring us to that place of surrendering once again. I also see when we go back to Genesis chapter 12, this wonderful promise that, that there's so much involved in, in these few little verses in verses 2 and 3. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. My mind went back to a show in the 1980s, The Equalizer. Don't waste your time trying to be The Equalizer. Ran from 1985, I had to look it up, to 1990. Man, uh, actor was Edward Woodward. He was Robert, his name was Robert McCall in the show. And it's always a retired detective coming back to make things right. But you know what? We think, and I use that kind of as tongue in cheek and as Christians, we think sometimes vengeance is our, ours, but that's never the case. When we look closely at this passage, we, we just surface reading will tell us this. He calls us, I'm going to bless you and you are to be a blessing. All people will be blessed, God says, through my people. And I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. But the cursing part, God says, that's mine. <laughs> I will curse those who curse you. Cursing and vengeance, God says, I will take that on. You don't have to worry about that. And you shouldn't be about trying to do that. Now, at the same time as Christians, we take strong stances on abortion, that's an evil, trafficking, things like drug, things like the gender confusion right now. We take strong and firm stance on that, and we should. We ought to. But those who curse you or curse the church or curse Christianity, God says, I'll take that on. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. And I've said this so many times before here, but he does a far better job of it than you and I could. Our God will not be mocked and he reminds us in this promise to Abraham, don't worry, those who curse you, I will curse. I will take care of that. And on the flip side of that is that you are blessed to be a blessing. And we talk about that all the time as a church. That's our call. We've been redeemed so that we can tell others about our Redeemer. We've been rescued so we can tell other people how we've been rescued. We are one beggar telling another beggar where we found a piece of bread. We're blessed so we can do things like we did the last two weeks in day camp where this place was transformed into another universe. <laughs> so we can bless our community. Things like our hope chest and ministering to seniors who are outside our walls and just all of those things. I'm blessing you to be a blessing. That's where we find this. That's where this originates. And he says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's such a good picture, isn't it? That's why we often quote 1 Peter 4.10. It talks about our gifts. We are administering God's grace in its various forms. We're all given different gifts, various forms, to be a blessing to our community. That's our job. And God says, those who need to be cursed, I'll take care of that. You leave that vengeance to me. And then lastly, we, <clears throat> just a simple reminder that we walk by faith and not by sight. 
It's found in the book of Corinthians. Genesis 15, 6 is this verse that's repeated often. Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. It's the same principle in Noah's life. Remember, Rob talked about Noah a few weeks ago on Genesis 6, 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Was it because Noah was so good or so righteous? Not really. It was because God found him. Was it because Abraham was so good or so righteous when God found him in Ur of the Chaldees? And we know that God's finding us and our response in faith, they go hand in hand, don't they? It's a mysterious thing. But he calls us to himself and he calls us to walk by faith and not by sight. And so Hebrews, the, the, the 11th chapter, and I'll just, just end with that. It starts out by talking about faith. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then it's going to go through the whole list. By faith we understand that the universe was created at God's command. By faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith every one of you in this room and myself included who are trusting in Jesus Christ, we walk by faith. Abraham believed God. That was credited to him as righteous. We trust in Christ by faith. We are rescued by faith. We are rescued by this mysterious call of God and our response. And Abraham believed God the same way you and I do. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Let's pray together. Lord, we are looking at a massive subject this morning and, and next week as well when we study the life of Abraham. And we see this call that took place so many thousands of years ago. The call that you would bless your people. You would protect your people. You would watch over your people. You will guide them. And Lord, we are blessed to be a blessing. All of these promises are, we, we see traced through the Old Testament, fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and that name that is above every other name. And so we know that Abraham was a giant of our faith, but he was not the essence of our faith. That was found in the person and work of Christ. But Lord, help us to remember that it's not, it's not we who make a name for ourselves. It's you who do that. It's not wrong to question you, God, but I know in my own life it's far better to surrender to you. And Lord, we all have those questions. Abraham did. Every, every giant of the faith did along the way. But you call us to continue to walk by faith and not by sight. To rest in your promise that is sure to come true. That promise that is an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. Bless us to that end, Lord, for, and we'll give you thanks. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace both now and forevermore. Lord, help us to trust you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a great day today.